The Russian Revolution by Rosa Luxemburg, Chapter 8, Democracy and Dictatorship. The basic error of the Lenin-Trotsky theory is that they too, just like Kotsky, oppose dictatorship to democracy. Dictatorship or democracy is the way the question is put by Bolsheviks and Kotsky alike. The latter naturally decides in favor of democracy, that is, of bourgeois democracy, precisely because he opposes it to the alternative of the socialist revolution. Lenin and Trotsky, on the other hand, decide in favor of dictatorship in contradistinction to democracy, and thereby in favor of the dictatorship of a handful of persons, that is, in favor of dictatorship on the bourgeois model. There are two opposite poles, both alike being far removed from a genuine socialist policy. The proletariat, when it seizes power, can never follow the good advice of Kotsky, given on the pretext of the unripeness of the country. The genuine social or the hold on, the advice being to renounce socialist revolution and devote itself to democracy. It cannot follow this advice without betraying thereby itself, the international, and the revolution. It should and must at once undertake socialist measures in the most energetic, unyielding, and unhesitant fashion. In other words, exercise a dictatorship, but a dictatorship of the class, not of a party or of a clique. Dictatorship of the class, that means in the broadest possible form on the basis of the most active, unlimited participation of the mass of the people of unlimited democracy. As Marxists, writes Trotsky, we have never been idol worshippers of formal democracy. Surely we have never been idol worshippers of socialism or Marxism either. Does it follow from this that we may throw socialism on the scrap heap a la Canal, Lynch, and Parvis if it becomes uncomfortable for us? Trotsky and Lenin are the living refutation of this answer. We have never been idol worshippers of formal democracy. All that that really means is, we have always distinguished the social kernel from the political form of bourgeois democracy. We have always revealed the hard kernel of social inequality and lack of freedom hidden under the sweet shell of formal equality and freedom, not in order to reject the latter, but to spur the working class into not being satisfied with the shell, but rather by conquering political power, to create a socialist democracy to replace bourgeois democracy, not to eliminate democracy altogether. But socialist democracy is not something which begins only in the promised land after the foundations of socialist economy are created. It does not come as some sort of Christmas present for the worthy people who, in the interim, have loyally supported a handful of socialist dictators. Socialist democracy begins simultaneously with the beginnings of the destruction of class rule and of the construction of socialism. It begins at the very moment of the seizure of power by the socialist party. It is the same thing as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Yes, dictatorship, but this dictatorship consists in the manner of applying democracy, not in its elimination, but in energetic resolute attacks upon the well-entrenched rights and economic relationships of bourgeois society, without which a socialist transformation cannot be accomplished. But this dictatorship must be the work of the class and not of a little leading minority in the name of the class. That is, it must proceed step by step out of the active participation of the masses. It must be under their direct influence, subjected to the control of complete public activity. It must arise out of the growing political training of the mass of the people. Doubtless, the Bolsheviks would have proceeded in this very way were it not that they suffered under the frightful compulsion of the World War, the German occupation, and all the abnormal difficulties connected therewith, things which were inevitably bound to distort in socialist, any socialist policy however imbued it might be with the best intentions and the finest principles. A crude proof of this is provided by the use of terror to do to so wide an extent by the Soviet government, especially in the most recent period just before the collapse of German imperialism, 
and just after the attempt on the life of the German ambassador. The commonplace to the effect that revolutions are not pink teas is in itself pretty <clears throat> inadequate. Everything that happens in Russia is comprehensible and rep represents an inevitable chain of causes and effects, the starting point and end term of which are the failure of the German proletariat and the occupation of Russia by German imperialism. It would be demanding something superhuman from Lenin and his comrades if we should expect of them that under such circumstances they should conjure forth the finest democracy, the most exemplary dictatorship of the proletariat, and a flourishing socialist economy. By their determined revolutionary stand, their exemplary strength in action, and their unbreakable loyalty to international socialism, they have contributed whatever could possibly be contributed under such devilishly hard conditions. The danger begins only when they make a virtue of necessity and want to freeze into a complete theoretical system all the tactics forced upon them by these fatal circumstances and want to recommend them to the international proletariat as a model of socialist tactics. When they get in their own light in this way and hide their genuine, unquestionable historical service under the bushel of false steps forced on them by necessity, they render a poor service to international socialism for the sake of which they have fought and suffered, for they want to place in its storehouse as new discoveries all the distortions prescribed in Russia by necessity and compulsion, in the last analysis only byproducts of the bankruptcy of international socialism in the present world war. Let the German government socialists cry that the rule of the Bolsheviks in Russia is a distorted expression of the dictatorship of the proletariat. If it was or is such, that is only because it is a product of the behavior of the German proletariat, in itself a distorted expression of the socialist class struggle. All of us are subject to the laws of history, and it is only internationally that the socialist order of society can be realized. The Bolsheviks have shown that they are capable of everything that a genuine revolutionary party can contribute within the limits of historical possibilities. They are not supposed to perform miracles. For a model and faultless proletarian revolution in an isolated land, exhausted by world war, strangled by imperialism, betrayed by the international proletariat, would be a miracle. What is in order is to distinguish the essential form, the non-essential, the kernel from the accidental excrescences, excres, excrescences in the politics of the Bolsheviks. In the present period, when we face decisive final struggles in all the world, the most important problem of socialism was and is the burning question of our time. It is not a matter of this or that secondary question of tactics, but of the capacity for action of the proletariat, the strength to act, the will to power of socialism as such. In this, Lenin and Trotsky and their friends were the first, those who went ahead as an example to the proletariat of the world. They are still the only ones up to now who can cry with Hutton, I have dared. This is the essential and enduring in Bolshevik policy. In this sense, theirs is the immortal historical service of having marched at the head of the international proleta proletariat with the conquest of political power and the practical placing of the problem of the realization of socialism, and of having advanced mightily the, set the settlement of the score between capital and labor in the entire world. In Russia, the problem could only be posed. It could not be solved in Russia. And in this sense, the future everywhere belongs to Bolshevism.